We got an update on Jake Muzzin. We'll preview the Leafs and Wild game tonight. And what's Toronto's biggest concern right now? Find out all that more on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked on Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother from TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. With me, my co-host of the show, it's Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. And just a reminder that this is a daily Maple Leafs-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe to the show for free wherever you get your podcasts. You can now check us out on YouTube, Locked On Leafs. And Dave, we uh we must have ruffled some feathers out in Vancouver because yesterday we kind of got to talking about JT Miller and and the kind of the bombshell that Elliot Freeman dropped on the broadcast, and all of a sudden our views explode into the thousands on that clip that we put out there of us discussing JT Miller. So you can go check that out. We'll also have full episodes. We're pulling out clips. We've got a whole bunch of stuff cooking over at the Lockdown Lease YouTube page. So go subscribe uh, there. And like we said yesterday, at 500 views, we're going to do a giveaway of some kind and then a larger giveaway when we get to 1,000 subscriptions. Not views, subscriptions uh, is what I meant to say. So make sure you go subscribe and, and get yourself uh, involved and, and make yourself eligible for these giveaways once we hit those plateaus. But we got a fun show here today. Uh, it's a game day. Leave some wild. That'll be taking place later tonight at the Scotiabank Arena. Should be a solid one. The Minnesota Wild, real solid team. And, and Toronto looking to snap a, a three-game skid. Usually they play up to their opponent. Hopefully they can do the same here tonight. But before we get to that, uh, we got an update on Jake Muzzin. We're also going to play some cosign, no sign later as well. A game that we always love to play here on the show. Uh, but an update on Jake Muzzin. So, uh, obviously, everybody remembers the hit that he took on Chris Weidman in the game against the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, stayed overnight in Montreal. They did some tests, ran some tests, and he did not go with the team to Columbus. He ended up going the next day back to Toronto uh, to rest up and Today, there was a series of moves that was done, and I'll go into it, uh, Dave. Dude, Puckpedia, can we give a shout-out to Puckpedia? How great are they? Just displaying all the information that we needed here uh, to kind of follow along with this Jake Muzzin stuff. They make us sound smart, even though we have absolutely no idea sometimes about the salary cap. No, the salary cap is ridiculous, but Brandon Pridham, the Leafs assistant general manager, is just a genius, a capologist, and is able to circumvent this thing realistically to the best of his ability, better than anyone else in the business, to make sure that they take full advantage uh, of every loophole possible within the salary cap. So the series of moves that was made today um, that went into Muzzin eventually landing on LTIR uh, but he, Muzzin first moved on to IR, injured reserve. And then Rasmus Sandin was sent down as well. He makes $894,000. But coming up was Brennan Manel and Christian Rubens up to the main show. Um, and it actually ended up making their cap space, projected cap space, 217000 in projected cap space, down to just 10000 Dollars is all that the, all they had after making those moves, which actually sets the which somehow makes it better for Toronto to be cl as close to the cap as possible. Because prior to those moves being made, if they were to place Muzzin on LTIR, it would have only allowed them to exceed the cap by five point four one million dollars. But by making these moves, you can now exceed the cap by five point six two million dollars. So. You had an extra, you know, two hundred and ten thousand essentially to your cap space, and look, every dollar counts when it comes to the Maple Leafs and trying to, to uh, accrue as much cap space as possible. And uh, so, with Muzzin, eventually did end up getting put onto LTIR, and uh, I would assume that Rasmus Sandin will get called back up eventually. Uh, but the question is now with Muzzin, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be out for the year and that this space is now readily available. If he's, he does have to miss a minimum of 10 games or 24 days. So that's the, the minimum requirements for a player to miss if placed on LTIR. And that was the case a little bit later today. The question is, is he going to be ready to return in 10 games or within a month? Or is this something that maybe the Maple Leafs and Jake Muzzin are okay with keeping him out a little bit longer term and maybe doing what Mark Stone decided to do, where he said, you know what, I got this bat lingering back injury, maybe some extended time to rest up and that really get going in the playoffs. Could that be a situation here for the Maple Leafs? And then that allows them to really be aggressive at the deadline should they want to make a, a bigger move than just the tinkering or the insane cap gymnastics that would they would have had to go through if this is not part uh if this was not done. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to like Muzzin, like this is a head injury. It can be good one day and then the next day it could be we worse. The, they're always so hard to predict. And this is his second major head injury of 2022. Like, let's yeah. not forget, like this is the, the proximity of these injuries is pretty close in that like, let's just give him the time that he needs. You know, he might have other ailments too that we don't know about that could, you know, use a little bit of healing up. It it be- like, the way that he was playing, it seemed like he was kind of laboring out there. He wasn't, he was seemed a, a step slower than he was uh, earlier in the season. It could be age catching up to him, but also could be the fact that there's something else there and, uh, you know, getting the opportunity to fully heal up from those injuries could also be a benefit along with the head injury. You're right. Yeah. And like, when when it comes to, would you rather have Jake Muzzin in the lineup? Yes. But would you rather have a Jake Muzzin get injured again closer to the playoffs? And, you know, now you have kind of this the idea of, okay, if we, he's on LTIR right now, we know we can make moves now to kind of mitigate his absence rather than not make this move and potentially lose him closer to the playoffs and you didn't do anything to really address it or in the playoffs, worst case scenario, right? Like we've seen uh, it twice uh, before, literally the last two playoffs, they, they, you know, he had that whiplash injury against Columbus in the bubble. And then last year he went out in game six against Montreal and Tyler Toffoli's on record saying the second Muzzin went out, we knew that was it. Like that was, Mm -hmm. we were going to win that series. And that happened in game six, like late ish in game six. So, I, you know, there's, uh, there's, it's a weird predicament and it's, it's going to be tough to, you know, have that conversation with Muzzin because he's clearly a, a pro and he's going to want to play. I think my microphone, I may not have my, uh, my, <laughs> my Yeti mic on here. Let's, let's, let's change that. Tell me if my audio changes. It should. It should be a little bit more clear. Anyways, um, a little behind the scenes for the listeners there. But when it comes to Jake Muzzin, it's going to be difficult as a pro who wants to play in every day. He's a super competitive guy um, to just not play hockey for the next two, three months may not be an easy sell. You know what I mean? And and he may feel like he's ready to go at some point. But again, it is a head injury and you've got a whole life after hockey to worry about. I mean, look how long it took Sidney Crosby to kind of fully get over that major concussion that he suffered, um, you know, way back in the day at the, was it the New Year's Classic? He kind of took that hit. And there was even a game before that where I feel like there was an issue there. But around that Christmas, New Year's uh, hit that Crosby took, it took him about a year and a half to really get out of that funk and stop experiencing symptoms. You hope for the best for Jake Muzzin. Hopefully he can take his time um, to get ready. And if it just so happens that, you know, it works out for both parties where he is ready to go by the end of April, ready to go for, for May. I think that's best case scenario, realistically on both sides. You know what I mean? You, you allow Jake Muzzin the, 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 Time he needs to heal up, heal his body, rest his mind, uh, and then also at the same time, you open up that cap space to allow Toronto to go out and bolster their lineup if need be. Yeah, and w- after what we we talked about with you know the JT Miller Miller 
you know, potential rumor. This wouldn't happen if Jake Muslin was in the lineup because we know that trying to fit that cap hit is not easy to do because the Leafs would have to do some serious cap shenanigans to get it to work because this isn't just a move for this season. It's a move they have to consider for next season as well. Right. You know, Jake Muzzin, they can they can obviously make a move like that and not worry about this year with Jake Muzzin being out. Next year, it's a different story. But I, I think with Jake Muzzin being out, we're not even considering making bigger moves. Like, this is what Tampa was able to do with Kucherov out. Yeah. You know. Well, Jack Eichel and, and like, Jack yeah, Eichel. Vegas is doing it right now. Right. Vegas doing it right now. And, you know, we kind of. And I'm not going to say that we ragged on them a little bit and called it like conveniently inconvenient because now the Maple Leafs are kind of in that scenario and you feel for your player. And it's like, actually, yeah, like if you are ailing, take all the time you need. And then if if you're ready to come back by the time the playoffs start, and you feel comfortable. Perfect. That works out. That works out for you. And, and you know, Toronto would be better off with Muzzin in the lineup. But, you know, for a team that luckily got off to a good start, they have a decent cushion. Um, they may be able to allow themselves to not have Muzzin in the lineup and still get into the playoffs, still get into the dance, and most likely still end up with with you know one of the the same third place in the division spot that you would have anyways, realistically. So we'll see what ends up happening uh, with with Jake Muzzin if they end up keeping him on LTIR for the rest of the regular season. Maybe he's even not going to be back in the playoffs. Maybe this is a much longer term issue you know we've we've also seen that happen where concussions um and head injuries maybe jake muzzin says maybe i want to retire I mean, you never know what 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 could come of it but uh for now he's going to be on ltir and the maple Leafs will have to decide what to do in the next little bit with just a, about a month away from trade deadline uh some other unfortunate news that maple Leaf fans kind of woke up to today uh, Rodion Amirov, the team's 2020 first round pick. Um, some sad news that uh, Kyle Dubas is announcing that Amirov has been diagnosed with a brain tumor and will not play the rest of the regular season. Uh, it was discovered while undergoing treatment for another injury. He's currently in Germany undergoing treatment. His agent, Dan Milstein, uh, sharing that he is skating three times a week and working out every day. He is in good spirits, so he's fighting the fight. That's good to see. Uh, but his agent also tweeted out an email. So if anybody wants to reach out and wish uh, Rodion Amirov well, uh, you can reach out to him at uh, his email, which is amirov at goldstarhockey.com. Amirov at goldstarhockey.com. You can wish him uh, a full recovery there. And I know that us at Locked On Leafs wishing nothing but the best for uh, for Rodion Amirov. It's it, it's it's so unfortunate uh, for this to happen to, to anyone, let alone uh, a young 19, 20-year-old kid. Um, so, you know, fight the good fight, Rodion. And, uh, you know, if you guys want to send out an email to, to also wish him well, that's Amirov at goldstarhockey.com. Uh, why don't we hear a word from today's show sponsor before we get to our least wild preview, and then we'll play some cosign, no sign a little bit as well. Yeah, so today's episode is brought to our friends at Bet Online. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is getting going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey boxing and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage. Obviously that's over now, but if you were looking for (laughs) even more uh, sports information, they got it all there. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Yes. And uh, you can go make a wager on the wild and Maple Leafs game. That'll be going down tonight. Uh, I'm Mike DeStefano alongside. We got Dave Morissuti. We're the host of locked on Leafs, a, a daily Maple Leafs podcast, which you can subscribe to on YouTube. You could also find uh, the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, but yeah, tonight Maple Leafs and wild. You've got two of the top teams in the NHL uh, coming in, in and, and for a good old clash, but Toronto hasn't been 
playing well as of late, obviously, uh, on a three-game skid. Meanwhile, you got the Minnesota Wild coming in. They're 6-4 and four in their last 10, just a little bit over 500, but still a pretty solid team. Uh, what are you expecting out of tonight's tilt? This is going to be a heavyweight tilt. I, I just remember the last time these teams played each other, it was the first game that Mitch Marner missed with his uh, shoulder injury. Like it was a that was a while back in December. The Minnesota Wild are no joke. Like they are a team that you know what? It ain't a guarantee that the Leafs can come away with the win. They lost that game four three in a shootout. I mean, Kaprizov is one of I think he's one of like those guys like on another team that I enjoyed watching so much. He's he's really brought this Minnesota team kind of out of that, you know, not so fun team to watch. People are like, yeah, they play pretty well, but they're not the most entertaining group. I I would pay money to watch Kirill Kaprizov play hockey whenever I I can get that chance. Like he's just that good. I will say though, for the Leafs, when you look at the Wild. They they got they've they've got some injuries that they got to be careful. I, I think Mike, you probably have a a good bet on who's missing. I know that Zuccarello missed the last game. Yeah, it, it looks like Zuccarello as of now is probable for the game. So yeah. good chance that you could see Zuccarello, but uh, Jordan Greenway is doubtful. Uh, he's you know a good rugged third liner that they have there, and Matt Dumba. Uh, who's been out for, uh, you know, he's going to be out for the next couple of weeks for them as well. So Matt Dumba will not be there. So both teams missing uh, a pretty important part to their blue line. Obviously, Jake Muzzin not going to be there for Toronto as well. Uh, outside of that, they're they're relatively healthy at this point. Um, so, you know, both sides not going to have uh, an important blue liner on that team. But you look at, at both of these you know, both of these squads and they got to try and turn it around because, you know, the, the Maple Leafs lose of three in a row. But, you know, just take a look now at, at the Minnesota Wild. They've lost three of the last four and, and they haven't like when they lost, they're really not getting good goaltending either. So this is a chance for Toronto coming up against, uh, you know, some poor goaltending of late. Perhaps they can take advantage and finally start filling the net. Coming off a four-three loss to Ottawa the other night, they lost six to two to Florida. They lost six to three to Minnesota. They allowed four goals to the Detroit Red Wings um, about a week ago, or a little bit more than a week ago. So they haven't really been. Um, what is this now? One, two, three, four, five, five games in a row where they've given up at least three goals. Um, which is something that Toronto has also been doing. So goaltending hasn't quite been the strong suit for either team in this game. So it's going to be interesting I, for me, if I'm from a betting perspective at like betonline.net, I'd be betting the over in this game for sure. Um, they seem to be going over. You look at the Minnesota wild, literally their last one, two, three, four, five games have all gone over. And the Maple Leafs, I, I'm sure the very similar situation for the Maple Leafs, where it looks like one, two, three, uh, three of the last, Five have gone over, one's a push, but just one of their last five has gone under. So, you know, the Leafs are going over as well. So if you're betting this game, I would take the over, uh, to be honest with you. But uh, overall, what are some of the weaknesses outside of the goaltending that you think the Maple Leafs might be able to take advantage of here and and maybe vice versa for uh, for Minnesota? Yeah, I, I think for the Leafs, you know, they got to take advantage of a Minnesota team that's clearly missing a guy like Matt Dumba, who's crucial on the power play. Like I, I think you know, without him in the lineup, their power play is kind of, isn't the same. And yeah, like they've come, they've had some impressive victories, like that one against Edmonton where they won seven to three. They've also lost some pretty, you know, piss poor games that they needed to win, like Winnipeg, you know, a division opponent. Yeah. So like, if I'm the Leafs, I'm thinking about all right. We got to get a good start, and if their goaltending isn't, you know, doing so hot, you got to you got to get your chances early. And I I think stopping Kaprizov is going to be like number one focus. Like you like we've talked about guys who have thrived for the opposing teams. We talked about Line A with with uh, Columbus. I talked about Caulfield and Anderson with Montreal. 
those are the guys that were the you know that that brought it to the Leafs and they couldn't it, it, they failed in that assignment. So if I'm the Leafs, your assignment is Kirill Kaprizov. Do not lose that assignment because it has not gone for well for you the last few games. No, it hasn't. And let me just take a peek at his game logs too. I mean, this is a player. He's got 62 points in 47 games this year. Like he is sneakily rising up in the uh, up into the upper tier of the scoring category here within the league. And just take a look at this last thing, I guess last night in Ottawa or a couple nights in Ottawa, he was held pointless for the first time in five games, but he's got nine points in the five games prior to the loss to Ottawa. Um, So this guy's coming in on fire. He is one of the most premier dynamic players in the NHL, and absolutely, they're going to have to make sure that they keep on this guy. They're also going to have to make sure that they can keep up with a team that that can play physical. You know, like this is a physical team, the Minnesota Wild is, and and we've seen that they have sometimes shied away from that physicality at times against the bigger opponents. You know, we saw it happen in in St. Louis. We saw it happen, you know, a couple of weeks ago as well when they were taken on. Um, why am I blanking on the team? Uh, Calgary, you know, they, they shied away from, from that physicality and they got worn worn down a little bit. You know, they got to be able to dish it out here. They got to prove that they can play uh, a playoff-style hockey against a team that's got some skill but also plays, you know, a, a heavy brand of hockey. And, and I think that's something that the Maple Leafs are going to have to to make sure that they do in this game. And another uh, thing to keep an eye on, I'm, I'm going to just point to Matt Boldy. Ooh, sneaky player that has like I remember I wrote about like for sports and I write a lot of the new stuff when he got called up. I'm like, this is an interesting move. They brought him up and then they also brought up why am I, I I'm like oh um Marco Rossi. Hey, they brought both these guys up together, and Boldy has been. I mean, if he started with the season earlier. I think this is a guy that could have been in the Calder Trophy conversation. Yeah, he had a hat trick the like a week ago. Against yeah, against Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, like that's another he's guy. Fifteen points in seventeen games. He's almost had a point a game as a rookie in the NHL. He's only twenty years old. Yeah, Matt Boldy, and this is a good player, man. Like six foot two, buck ninety five. He's got a little bit of size to him. Is he's a good player as well. So yeah, he's another one that the Leafs are definitely going to have to key in on and make sure that they don't let him go. Ryan Hartman's having a, a, a fantastic breakout season. For them, Kevin Fiala is a, is a terrific goal scorer. Uh, Erickson Eck is ex- extremely hard to play against. He plays a solid two way game. They get a, a bunch of good good players that Toronto's going to have to try and go up against and match. And for a team, you look at that second line specifically. They're going to have to show up because unlike Montreal and unlike Columbus, this team has depth and waves of depth. So you can't just shut down one line and hope that that's good enough because they got guys who can come at you from all different angles, from multiple different uh, lines. So you got to make sure that you can match that and also get that that uh, that production from people that aren't named Bunting, Matthews, and Marner. And and that's really is a big thing too. They got to get that second line going. They really do. I thought they played okay in Columbus. It was definitely a much better effort, um, especially defensively than it was in Montreal. But now you got to get that offensive production to start going. Dude, in the last calendar month, John Tavares has two primary points. Two primary points. He's gone 14 straight games without a goal at five on five. His longest streak since 2012. That's got to end. That's got to end. And hopefully it ends here uh, against the Minnesota Wild. So should be a fun game. Should be a good game, though. Like we said earlier in the podcast, Maple Leafs tend to play up to their opponents. And last time this game went to a shootout. Perhaps, you know, we got another shootout in store, at least a, a close game. But at the end of the day, I think it'll be a good one. It'll be a fun one. It's two highly talented uh, squads who, who like to do a lot of goal scoring and lately don't like to do a lot of puck saving so <laughs> i think it could be a high scoring affair as well uh all right let's take uh, uh another break here really quickly and when we return let's uh let's play a little bit of cosine no sign dave so we'll do that when we get back here on the locked on leaves podcast 
Welcome into the Locked on Leafs podcast. Uh, Mike DiStefano with you alongside. I've got Dave Morissuti. We're the host of Locked on Leafs. If you have not, uh, if you're new to the podcast and you haven't heard this segment before, it's a fun little game we like to play called Cosign, No Sign. We both have three statements that we're going to make. If we agree with the statement, we co-sign it. If we disagree with it, then we no-sign it. So, Dave, uh, why don't you go first, throw out your first statement for me, for me to co-sign or no-sign. So I'm going to go with a non-lease one to start with. It might involve a lease, depending on how things go, but uh, there's a report that Philip Forsberg is out, uh, is apparently being shopped right now. Did so my co-sign, no-sign, this is the end of the Philip Forsberg tenure with the Nashville Predators. Uh, I'm going to co-sign it. I don't think that's smoke. I, Andy Strickland is the one who... Andy Strickland's the one who tweeted that out, and he's pretty plugged in, I think. Um, so I, I don't think that he's just saying that clearly. And he said actively shopping. Not that he's listening or he's hearing his name get popped up, that they're actively shopping. And this is a player who's only making $6 million, and he is in a contract year. He's going to be a UFA. I bet you with the season that he's having, he's going to want a lot more than $6 bucks. So are they going to be willing to pay him? I don't know if that's the case. And instead of letting him walk, I could see them, yeah, trading him away and, and, and getting picking up some assets for him. Is Toronto that team? I, I don't know. I think there are some other players. Like, I would prefer a JT Miller over a, 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 a Philip Forsberg myself, but I could definitely see some teams out there be really interested in, in a Philip Forsberg. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I'll co-sign it. I think that that's, that that's his tenure in Nashville could be over. Yeah. All right. So what's your, uh, what's your first no co-sign no side. All right. Uh, well, similar vein it's trade season, which is always a fun time to chat about this, but we're going to stick with the Toronto Maple Leafs when we have this trade discussion. Uh, Dave, an upgrade in the top six is currently now a more of a pressing need than a top four defenseman. I still think top four. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can, I can sign with that. Uh, you don't sound, you don't sound very confident with your answer there. It's just tough, right? Like when you're thinking about what the Leafs are, like what we've been talking about the whole time. And then just something new pops up. You're like, it makes it so tough, but I, I, I can get behind that. I, I, I think given what the Leafs need to do and like what we've seen from this Leafs team, it only makes sense that they go that route. How much of it do you think has to do with Jake Muzzin, though? Because if Muzzin's going to be injured and he's going to be out, you don't know what he, you're going to get in Muzzin if he comes back. Mm -hmm. You might need to have to, to go out and get your 3-4 just in case. So I, I don't I don't think a top six is more pressing than a top four. I, I'm no signing that one myself. So the only honest. reason why I think a top six is because if the if the like, it might not it matter what the defense does if the offense isn't there. Like if the if if we can't rely on that second line to produce, that's putting a lot of pressure on the rest of the team. And it like does. in the playoffs, when it's so hard to get goal scoring. I think you try to improve that. You make that area like the best, like as as bolstered as you can, and then they might not be able to get a three four, but if they can get the depth that they haven't had before, and options that they haven't had before. I think you can get by with that, but I can't get by if the goal scoring just isn't there. I mean, yeah, we've seen it before where Matthews and Marner they get shut down in the playoffs, and then you got to rely on your depth and. You know, last year, outside of William Nylander, there wasn't enough depth that stepped up behind them. And that was kind of, you know, what, what cost them in the end. Um, Kerfoot wasn't too bad in the playoffs last year, uh, playing alongside you know, with Willie and, and Galchenyuk. But do you want to rely on that again this season? If you can make an upgrade, I think they do it. But I, I think they still are, like, if they had one bullet in the chamber, I think they would probably try and bring in a defenseman over a winger. Despite all this JT Miller rumors that are out there, like if it came down to it, it's like 
you can only get one of JT Miller or Hampus Lindholm apparently is now the new hot name that all these insiders want to throw out there, you know, between Hampus Lindholm and JT Miller. And they only had the same package was offered and they both said, okay, we'll accept. I think they say, actually, we're going to go with the Lindholm deal and bolster that defense and, and try and shore that up and roll the dice with Kerfoot. Cause I think, you're safer rolling the dice with Kerfoot or Akasha than you would be with Labushkin or Hall as your top four defensemen. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I did hear a rumor, though, actually. Well, not a rumor, but there was a report by uh, who, Rick, Rick uh, Dollawall oh, out yeah. in Vancouver. Apparently, Vancouver's interested in Timothy Lilligren. They've been keeping tabs on Timothy Lilligren out in Vancouver, and Oh, JT Miller's conversation from yesterday, that, that name got dropped a little bit. Timothy Lilligren, I'm not saying that that would be the main piece, but if they're inquiring and they're listening and watching Timothy Lilligren, maybe it's because they are having discussions on uh, on a bigger trade and he could be part of the deal. Who knows? They did sign Patrick Alvin to be their general manager, who is from Swedish or is is Swedish from Sweden and has deep ties with a lot of these Swedish prospects and Timothy Lilligren, maybe one of those guys, but just something, uh, a little food for thought there. All right. What's uh, what's your second one? Uh, we got to go with a little John Tavares one here. Uh, I'm looking at the schedule coming up and I do think we see John Tavares's goal scoring drought end within the next three games. Who are they playing the next three games? So it's you got obviously the Wild, then you got the Red Wings, and the Capitals. Oh yeah, I'll co-sign that. I will co-sign that. I I can't see this goal scoring drought going too much longer. I mean, the last game he did have a, a few good looks. I think he led the team with like five slot shots too, or uh, three slot shots. I think um, five shots in total. Like he would, he had a couple of really good opportunities eventually he's going to catch a bounce. Maybe they, they have a, a, a wide, a, an empty net and they just send him out on the ice to try and get that goal. I had Rick talking on Leafs lunch today. And he even said, sometimes if you got a, a, a superstar who's struggling like that, a, a good way to get them off the schneid is, you know, they just want to see a puck go in the back of the net, whether there's a goalie between the cage or not really doesn't matter. And sometimes just an empty net goal, could spark that offense for that player. So I think in the next three games, whether it's you know a tip on the power play or a nice setup by Kerfoot or Nylander, maybe he ends up on a line at some point with like Matthews or, or, or Marner during a line change or whatever. I, I think within the next three games, we will get a goal from John Tavares. The signs are there that he's improving. Um, I think the production will follow. Okay. That's uh, hope. Go ahead. You have uh, a comment there? No. Uh, go with your second one. All right. Jake Muzzin will remain on LTIR for the rest of the season. Regular season. I'm going to sign this one because we know how much the Leafs try to massage the cap. And I think this is the one thing they didn't maybe count on that now kind of falls into the lap. I think of it like Patrick Kane when the when the Blackhawks lost him, yeah. and, and they're like, he's legitimately injured. Maybe he can come back for the regular season, but why chance it? And we can add as much as we need on his cap. It like that was a, like that that right there. I think that's the comparable situation over a Kucherov where he was injured at the beginning of the year and they didn't really give a timeline. Right this one here, it's like if it kind of. It was an unexpected situation. I think the Leafs, knowing their cap situation and how much they've had to dollar in, dollar out, and move guys around, I think this is something that, and and with every insider even talking about it and LTIR being used, I think it's it's a real possibility. So I think, yeah, I'm going to sign this one. Yeah, I think it's a strong possibility as well. And, um, you know, if I had to put like a percentage chance of this happening, of him playing a game, another regular season game, I think there's probably only like a 20% chance of that happening. It's not zero, but I, I, I still think it's 80-20 that 
Jake Muzzin doesn't return until the playoffs. I think that as well. Uh, your third one, sir. I was kind of bouncing around with my third one here, whether to go trade deadline or whether to go something Leafs related. With the Canucks and the Leafs playing very soon, um, I think it'll be but before, uh, you know what I'll say that for the next coast I know sign because we'll have some time to think about this. Okay. Um, but I think all right, I'm just debating which one I want to go with. All right, here we go. Uh William Nylander gets benched if he doesn't produce more in terms of he gets demoted to a different spot in the lineup. Uh I'm gonna no sign it. <sighs> The problem I have with that is who do the Leafs really have to move up into the top six to replace them? That'll give them more production. I think it's more so trying to move. Like if they like maybe like switch him and Andre Kasha just to do something a little different. You trust Willie Nylander on the third line as like a, as a checking role with camp. Like they tried that before and they didn't like it at all. They swapped it after like, Literally five minutes into the game, they're like, no, nope, never mind. We're not doing that anymore. That's not happening. Remember, they, they put Kasha up on the top line with Matthews and Bunting, and then they put uh, Marner with Tavares and Kerfoot, I think it was. I think it was McCabe, and then it was like Camp. Yeah, and then it was Kerfoot, yeah. Camp, and and Nylander, and legitimately five minutes into that game, he was like, okay, never mind, scrap it. We're not doing that anymore. And then he ended up putting everything back the way that it was. Um, and I think that like a lot of the comments that we got on that, on that JT Miller video was, Oh, this team doesn't need another top six player. I think they do because there's not a lot of flexibility with this lineup. Like Sheldon Keith doesn't have a lot of options. You know what I mean? I, the only real option that he has, if he wants to up, get an upgrade on Alex Kerfoot in that top six is, if he flips one of Nylander or Kasha to the offside to play the left wing, and then you know whichever one stays on their right side, I guess fills in as as a second line right winger. But outside of that, like there's not much there. You're not going to put Spets up there. You're not going to put Simmons up there. You're not going to put, you know, I don't think Mikheyev is a is a second line winger either. You know, Pierre Engvall's not himself. Like they just don't really have a guy who can go up and down the lineup and and produce in a positive way. So I do feel that this team might need to go out and get like a, another top six addition, just pure to give this team flexibility. Like what if one of those guys goes down? What if Alex Kerfoot gets hurt? What do they do? What if, again, Tavares gets hurt in the playoffs? What do they do? They don't have enough depth on this team and, and like top six scoring depth especially on the left side. So, yeah, what was the original cosign? Oh, well, whether they were going to demote Nylander if, his, if that second. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they don't have the depth to to really move things around. Like move the way things around, play. yeah. Like, I feel like Nylander is still the most productive player in the top six, like where he's at. You know, demoting him I don't think will help this team. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to no-sign that one. All right. Uh, yeah. My third one for you here, Peter Mrazek will be given at least one start in the NHL playoffs. Oh, that's a good one. You know what? I can legitimately see that as a possibility. I'm going to sign it just because if Campbell has a bad game in the playoffs, they could easily turn to Mrazic. And uh, I watched that Carolina flip-flop that they did in the playoffs. With Curtis McElhaney? <laughs> yeah, it's not ideal. You Actually, know, it was Reimer last year. It was Reimer. It was Reimer. It was Reimer. 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 But it was McElhaney the season prior, I think. Season prior, then they added Reimer. I, I, this is what I like. When it comes to the Leafs, like, there's not, the margin for error is so small. I don't, 
want them to do that because you want to have one guy. Yep. I had to, I had time off for a sec. Did, does it piss you off that both McElhaney and James Reimer have had more playoff success than any of the Toronto Maple Leafs in the last couple of years? We were doing so well, Mike. We were doing <laughs> so well, Mike. Oh, man, I know. And then that, I, I just – a reminder. It's like, yeah, Carolina just takes all these goaltenders, and now they have Frederick Anderson another former Maple Leafs goaltender, and there's a good chance that they will have success and win around. And, you know, the Maple Leafs, we'll see what happens there. Anyways, continue. Peter Mrazek, you're on board. Do you think he'll get a start? I think a start, it might not be. It could even be a potential situation where Jack Campbell just... I, I think of it like what, what Leonard and Fleury went through last year. Yeah. They kind of wrote the hockey. How quick of a hook, Phil? Like you think one game will, and and that's it, or like how quick of a hook do you think this will be? It all depends, I think, on the situation. Like if it's like the first game and and Campbell doesn't do well, you can you can afford to give him a second one. But if he lays an egg on the second one, that that's the hook. Like I I think the margin for error all depends on the situation and where where it happens. Like. You have to, you have, this is like the toughest part that every head coach has to deal with is making the decisions in the right moment. I think you can't go too hasty with it, but you also can't be like, ah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go no, We're down three, one, but we're going to stick with Jack. Like you have to kind of think of your are like, there's jobs, I think on the line. And like, that's, that's one where if your goaltender loses it for you and you had the option to go to someone else and you were, Talking about this being a one A one B situation, yeah, doesn't look good on you. Yeah, it, it's as a coach, I would hate to be, I would hate to have a tandem in the playoffs because you'll always be second guessing yourself. Like if you lose oh, a game, oh, you're sure. always second guess: Should I have played this goalie? Should I have played that goalie? Would it have been different? Whereas if you got a Vasilevsky, if you've got a Jacob Markstrom, you know, in the past they had Freddie Anderson, a, a, a guy you knew was going to start you each and every game, and he definitely gave you the best chance to win every game. Do you have that faith in either Campbell or Morazic? I feel like after a loss, you'll sit there and you will think to yourself, what would have happened if I played the other goalie? You know, I just I don't envy Sheldon Keith to be in that position. That's for no. that's for damn sure. But uh yeah, I don't think it'll be an overly long hook. I, I really don't think it would be, especially if they continue to play, um, or Campbell continues to play at the pace that he has over the last three months almost, definitely last two months. I mean, it's it's not been pretty. I not been pretty at all. I think uh between the two of them. They have one of the worst, like the second and third worst save percentage at five on five among starting goaltenders. And like that's that's where it kills, right? Like the Leafs have done so well on special teams that like that like the five on five is just so is it, it that that's what kills it, right? You know, losing a game because you don't you're, you're playing well five on five, but you're not goaltenders aren't performing at that level. You got a top a power play that's at the top of the league. You've got a penalty kill that for a while was top three. I think I checked today. I want to say that they're six now. Um, some other teams have kind of climbed up a little bit, but regardless, for the most part, you've had a top five PK unit. You've had the number one power play unit, yet you're struggling to win games because you're getting outscored because you're getting outproduced at five on five. Cause you can't get that safe. It's tough. It's tough. And don't look now. Don't look now. But the Boston Bruins are inching a little bit closer to the Maple Leafs by by the day. They are now completely squared at 50 games apiece. There's only six points between them. Yeah, this is not ideal. Like, I was like, ah, we got a good lead on the Bruins. This isn't something to worry about. Two weeks later, it's like, you idiot. Yeah, (laughs) Like, like... Leafs have dropped three in a row. The Bruins have won a couple here. Without Brad Marchand. Without Brad Marchand. They finally have, I think, landed on Jeremy Swayman. They're finally going to give him the reins and hope he can get it done. He's looked good as of late. Uh, They could be one of those guys. We talk about Philip Forsberg. I mean, they could be interested in a Philip Forsberg. They could be interested in maybe even a JT Miller. You know, they could be big-time players 
uh, at the at the trade deadline because that's a team with a with a closing window in my estimation. And if they can get themselves ahead of Toronto here, you know now you now you're playing with for the wild card. I don't know. It's it, they're, I'm not saying Toronto's going to fall out of the playoffs here. I think the playoffs are pretty set. The teams that are there, but. I don't know if Toronto's as stable in the uh, in the three hole as maybe we thought a couple of weeks ago, as they hit this skid. I still think it's likely that they finish up with a divisional spot, but I'm just saying they're on the heels. It's only six points, and I think there still might be three or four games left against Boston this season. Like they're still we well, only played games. once this year, so. Yeah, so there's there's still a few games to go against the Bruins. You drop those, it's over, right? Like if if they both have the same record going forward, yet Boston wins those games against Toronto, it looks like it's just two left. So um, one at the end of March, one at the end of okay. April. But what happens in between? They still Leafs still have to play Florida. They haven't played Florida at all. They I think probably have one more against Tampa at least. You know, they got to play Montreal <laughs> uh, and Ottawa. Like the Atlantic division is not easy, guys. Like no, they not. need to realize this is a tough division, even though the, 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 the standings might not indicate that Detroit, Montreal, Ottawa. They're not easy wins now. Like Dude, Montreal is a different team under Marty St. Louis. Like we clowned him for for losing. We clown the, the least for losing to Montreal the other day. But they're on a four-game winning streak and legitimately look like a different team. Like they're out there, they just beat Buffalo, and granted it's Buffalo, but four nothing handily, just easy, easy win. And uh, you know it's they they they're on a four-game winning streak. Before this four-game winning streak, I'm pretty sure they only had like seven or eight wins. Like they have half of their wins come in this last week and a half. It's ludicrous when you actually think about it it's wild uh anyways we got a jet though uh good fun podcast today dave uh tomorrow uh we'll uh break down the game against the leafs and the wild it's tonight at seven o'clock i believe this is a tsn game so you can check it out on tsn4 you could listen to it on tsn 1050 i know that's a fact the tap man will have it. Uh, but that's to do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On These Podcasts on all podcasts and platforms. If you daily these content, follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morisuti. Follow the show on Twitter as well at Locked On Leafs. And go subscribe to us on YouTube. That's Locked On Leafs on YouTube. Uh, we'll be back with another episode tomorrow to recap the game against the Leafs and the Wild. Enjoy the game. Until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.